Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Rasmus, who'll be giving our second talk of the day on resizable sketches. Okay, yeah. So, thanks everyone. As the title says, I'm going to talk about resizable sketches. And this is basically motivated by a gap between theory and practice. So, in theory, sketches are, are great. They allow arbitrarily good approximation, sublinear space, and so on. But, you know, sometimes in practice, you know, it, it doesn't... Maybe, maybe you have missed some, some details. Um, and what I'll focus on today is how you set the space parameters. Okay. So a lot of sketches, most I would say, uh, you've, space is a parameter. So when you construct the sketch, you say how much space is it, is it going to, to use, or at least the bound on the space, and this is going to be fixed for the lifetime of the sketch. Okay. And then you get some accuracy as a function of space and other parameters. But as we also heard in uh, some, some of the previous talks, um, actually in practice you might want to be able to change the space over time to adjust the accuracy. Okay. And when I submitted, when I decided I want to talk about this in this workshop, it was kind of a theoretical practical problem. I hadn't actually talked to people who who, uh, who said they had this problem, but I was happy to, to learn from the people here at, at, at Yahoo, and it was also mentioned in Lee's talk yesterday, that actually you do want to uh, resize sketches as, as you go along. Okay? In particular, you might want to start with a very small sketch and increase it over time. Um, yeah, if you go to the data sketches um, documentation, you will also see these kind of things mentioned that actually you can deal with sketches of different sizes and they can be merged and, and uh, resized and, and so on. And I think this is something that at least hasn't, consider, uh, hasn't received a lot of um, attention, I think, in the, in the theory literature. In this talk, I'm going to give three examples. It's going, I don't have a lot of slides, so don't, don't hesitate to uh, interrupt me with questions. So the first topic is uh, expandable filters. So this is something I started working on 10 years ago. So we had some theoretical results back then that I'll talk about. And then recently we figured out how to actually make this into something. And then I'm going to talk about expandable versions of some well-known sketches, uh, Mr. Grease, heavy hitter sketch, and the k-minimum value sketch that can be used for various things, inclu including cardinality estimation. So these are really simple. Um, ways of making these uh, sketches expandable. They may be well known, but I haven't seen them described in the literature. So let's, uh, let's start. Okay, yeah, and I'm, there's going to be few answers and, and many questions, right? Uh, all right, so yeah, so this basically started when I was visiting Microsoft Research 2013, and I worked with uh, Gil, Segev and Uli Vida back then. And what we wanted to look at was the approximate membership problem. Okay. So maybe you know about Bloom filters. So this is the problem solved by, by Bloom filters. So you have some, some set of, SI, of size n. And what you want to represent is an approximation of this set. So this approximation, let's call it S prime. It should be a superset. So we do, never want to make errors that we think some, something is uh, not in the set while actually it is. And we want the property that we don't overestimate too much. In particular, for anything that is not in the set, the probability that is included in our estimate should be at most epsilon. Okay. So this is approximate membership. Um, and it was, it's known since the late 70s uh, how you do this kind of in a static setting. Okay. So you can do this with basically n log 1 over epsilon bits. Um, and this is also optimal, so you can show it. So this is all, all good, but this requires that you know a bound on n. Okay. Um, so what we start looking at, what, is, what if you, you don't have a bound on n, right? What if, you know, your, your set is just growing and growing, and you need to maintain this estimate over time? So you get one element at a time, and, and you want to maintain uh, kind of a dynamic approximation. And the bad news is here that we cannot really hope to match the kind of the static setting. Okay. So, and we're able to show a lower bound that 
at some point, if we insert, if we do n insertions, then at some point we have used log log n bits per element in S. Okay. So at some point, we, it could be early, it could be late, but at some point we need S, size of S times log log n bits. And this is kind of uh, inevitable information theoretically. Um, and this is actually tight. So there's an upper bound that you can use kind of what, what we had before. Uh, this n log 1 over epsilon plus n log log n bits. Okay. So this was this was all nice. Um, but then, uh, yeah, and actually let, let me start by telling you how this works because it's kind of the, the upper bound. Um, so because it's, it's pretty simple. Okay. So we use a hash function and for simplicity, I'm just going to assume that we hash to the real values between zero and one. Okay. And we are going to discretize this hash function in, in different ways. Okay. So let's define hm as the hash function that takes h of x, multiplies it by m, and then rounds down. So it basically discretizes h to um, log m bits. All right. So we're going to use uh, hash functions of, of this form. And now, in the case where n is known, there's a, a very simple way of solving the problem optimally, which is that you use m equal to n over epsilon. So basically you hash to a domain of size n over epsilon, and then you store the set of hash values. Okay. So it's n values in a range of size n over epsilon. And information theoretically, you can do this using basically n log one over epsilon. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then what is this? What is the approximation? Well, it's it consists of all the elements that have a hash collision with something in this in the uh, in, in S under this hash function. Okay. And because this set has density epsilon, the probability of a hash collision is epsilon. So this is what we want. Um, but this requires, I mean, even the description of the hash function here requires that we know n. We actually don't need to know s in advance, but we do need to know n, the number of elements that we want to end up with. So what can we do? I mean, kind of the obvious first idea is, well, why don't we just, you know, hash, you know, in increase the range of this uh, hash function, right? So we start with some range, and then at some point we get the, we get, in, we, yeah, the range is, is too small and we double it. All right, so we, let's try m being the smallest power of two, that is big enough. Okay. So the trouble is that we don't really have the full information to do this doubling without losing something, right? So suppose we know some hash value uh, when we have a range of size m. If you want to double the range to size 2m, well, there are two possible values, right? Because we want to go from the first log m significant bits of h of x to uh, log m plus one significant bits, right? So there are basically two completions, and we don't know which 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 we which one we have. So basically, we have to. The only thing we can really do is, uh, or ho hope to do, is to maintain a superset. Okay. So we, we can basically put both both possibilities in our approximation. Uh, unfortunately, this makes um, the error grow. So so we are not going to be able to control kind of the error rate here. So this is a drawing of of the situation. So suppose so the red cells here include uh, indicate the hash values when we hash to a range of size 16. Maybe we double the range to size 32. And then, you know, this hash value here corresponds either to this or that, but we don't know which one. And we need a one-sided approximation, so we need to include both. Okay. Um, but then when we get further insertions, of course, we can we, we know the exact va hash value in the in the range of size thirty two. Okay. So it's it kind of um, doesn't quite work, okay? Because the the fraction of uh, the fraction of of elements that actually are in the in the set of hash values is is going to be larger and larger. Um, but there's a a slight variation that actually works, okay? So we're going to be a little bit more aggressive 
So we are going to increase the, or double the size of the, of the hash <coughs> table a little bit sooner. Okay, so before we said n over epsilon, now we are going to say we are going to round up to something that is at least n log squared n. So it's just going to grow slightly superlinearly. Okay. And it turns out that if we do this, then actually the probability of collision is going to be become smaller and smaller over time. Okay. So in particular, we have these expansion phases that where we double the, the size of the, of the range of the hash function. And in you can convince yourself that in the ith expansion phase, all the elements that, you, that are inserted there, the probability that you collide with one of them is going to be something like i divided by epsilon, uh, sorry, epsilon divided by i squared. Okay. So it, it decreases um, over, over time. And this basically means that we get the total collision probability is going to be the, the sum epsilon over i squared. Um, and this converges. Okay. So we get, uh, we can bound the total collision probability by it. Okay. And the space usage is, is what I claimed before, because now we don't have such a sparse set, but it's almost as sparse. So the sparsity is no longer epsilon, but epsilon divided by log squared n. So we need an, an additional log log n bits per, per element to represent. So these are expandable filters. Simple enough, right? Uh, question from Bob? Um, you can't, you don't have access to the original set, which means you can't, sorry. You don't have access to the original set, which is the reason you need yes, the two bits. Exactly. If you had a re access right. to the that's, original set, you could rehash everything, right? Thank you, yes. So if you had some way of getting access, having access to the original sets, you could, in fact, you know, recompute whatever you needed. So the lower bound crucially relies on the fact that um, you know, you don't have any way to go back. All you have is is kind of the sketch. That's, that's, that's a great point. Thank you. Yes. So it makes me understand the idea. So the issue beforehand was that whenever you're doubling the leading bit in front, whenever you double it, you could be either zero and one. You need to label both of them. That's the picture here. Right. Right. So. Why does, like, if I increase how big M is supposed to be, how does that lower the issue of, like, doubling all of these? Yeah, these I mean, feel... I guess, okay, so, yeah. So, so I guess the intuition is that you, that you kind of, uh, you make the set sparser and sparser. Okay. Um, right, or also a, a kind of the, the, the set of new elements that you are that you are allowing in each round mm -hmm. is sparser and sparser. Okay, but then so the that, first elements yeah. inserted are still going to have like a very yes. large number. I mean, the the first, I mean, they're not going to disappear at all, right? So they, you're going to, you cannot kind of really decrease the probability of colliding with something that is a result of one of the early uh, Insertions. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, Thanks. Yes, because we you don't have the information. Yes. So just going back to an earlier question, if you're in a mode to begin with where the sketch is quite sparse, could you keep some side information, possibly the, the identifiers, alongside knowing the sparsity rate of the array? And then uh, you can do this re this doubling or however you call it. Track the sparsity, and then as soon as that hits a threshold, then switch mode into this type of estimation setting. Yeah, I think. I mean, that's that's. Uh, I think that's another w way of doing it. I mean, in some sense, what we are we are, you know, kind of increasing the information that we store per elements um, over time. So in order to kind of, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how to f formulate it, but, but, but I mean, basically, basically, if you start storing 
identifiers of, of elements, I mean, you you immediately get like log or something, right? So, so, so I think um, you have to be a little bit careful. Could you show, or do you have a corresponding diagram like the above case? You know, where you use the, the better idea? Um, I mean, this is actually, I mean, it looks the same in both cases. Oh. It's, it's just a question of when do you expand? At what point do you, do you move to the next? Okay, so, so the kind of the way it works is identical. You, you kind of, uh, I mean, basically each element in, in, in the previous set re gets replaced or represented by two elements in the next. And then you um, go on from there, right? So it's, but it's, it's, simply, it's simply a matter of how many things do you allow to be inserted before you, the next doubling, right? And this, this number is going to, we're going to have to, make that number decrease slightly in each round in order to make sure that we keep the uh, kind of false positive rate in, in check. So isn't there a limit then to the number of times you could do this doubling? No, not really, not really. Uh, but of course, I mean, you will pay, you will pay, you will pay the logarithm of the number of doublings. So that's the log log in uh, <coughs> space cost. So there is there is a cost. All right. So yeah, thanks for these questions. So all right. Um, so this seems, I mean, this is relatively simple conceptually, but if you think about practical application, uh, there's actually quite a few things that makes this uh, tricky, right? You need a high performance, dynamic, succinct membership data structure. You actually also want to support deletions in many applications. And you can, I mean, everything works conceptually easy, but you need to be able to store a multi-set in order to uh, allow deletions. Because if you, do, if you only store a set, I mean, there could be several elements with the same hash value, right? So you cannot just remove that element from the that hash value. But if you store multisets, store how many elements have this hash value, then, then things actually work even with deletions. Uh, and then there's the issue of, of kind of making the all the lower order terms insignificant. Uh, so it took 10 years and help from some people from the database community. So uh, Nev Dayan and Pedro Riviego. Um, to actually make make this happen, okay, we we didn't work for ten years, but uh, but it, it it took a while, and this just appeared uh, in Sigma this this year. So I think it was quite nice to see that eventually, at least, you know, these theoretical ideas uh, had some kind of uh, effect on uh, something that is probably useful. Um, and I'm not going to go into details, but just to give you an idea about what goes inside this. Um, data structure, named the infinity filter, so they are really good at, uh, at naming, naming stuff in the database community. Um, but basically these are the, this is a picture of the succinct dictionary and you kind of have to split it into several parts, some that are active, some that are kind of secondary and just uh, lying around and so forth. Um, theoretically, we get kind of the right space usage, the right update time, but annoyingly the query time for the practical solution that we came up with was is a little bit off. So theoretically, it's logarithmic in N, almost logarithmic. In practice, actually, the, this ratio between the logarithm of N and the logarithm of one over epsilon is not that big. So maybe not a huge deal. Um, but we actually managed uh, recently to, to also find something practical that nails the query time to constant. And now we needed a name that was uh, kind of beat infinity filter that was a little bit challenging, but then we came up with Aleph filter. So, so it's, it's great that there are these uh, very, very big, uh, big numbers that exist. All right. Amortized time bound should have I'm kind of guessing that. Uh, for the for the new result, I think we can also deamortize it. 
Yeah. But I ha I have to double check. Yeah. Practical. Yeah. So it's uh yeah so. Actually, related question to the amortization. Oh, sorry, dear. To the amortization. I I remember there was this ICALP twenty twenty paper by watching you and two others, which yes. also I think tackled the deamortization. Do you, I don't know uh, anything yes. about how they do it, but is is anything in there practical or was it useful in this infinity? Yeah, time? I mean we didn't uh, we didn't use anything from that paper. I think it's more of a theoretical paper. I believe that's also I think they. they they also try to get really low low order terms. I think, like uh, nailing the, the the leading 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 constants. Um, here we're kind of happy with kind of additive O of n bits. So one more question to make make sure I understand um, your Bloom filter is over time is the um, growth of space sublinear. No, so the, the it's proportional. Then the, the space is slightly superlinear. Oh, in the number of elements. I see. But it's sublinear in the number of bits to describe an element. If that makes sense. I'm more concerned about <coughs> the actual space consumed. Yeah. No. Is a little super superlinear. Yes, but that's that's a lower bound saying that you cannot hope to solve this problem in sublinear space. All right. Thank you. So let's let's move to the next uh, sketch, Mr. Agrees. So it solves the heady Hevers problems. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to look at the insertion only case. We have a stream of elements. We want to maintain about information about frequent items or heady hitters, and we have some space budget S. So Mr. Agrees sketch is this very nice sketch. I'm sure most of you know it, but just for for completeness, um, basically it stores a a uh, set of pairs, x comma lx, where x is an item from the from the input, and lx is a is a counter that is a lower bound for the frequency of of x. Okay, so let's call the true frequency cx. Um, and of course, eventually you run out of counters, and then what you do is you decrement all the counters, and then you throw away counters elements that have a count of zero. So very simple idea. Uh, but it gives you actually a very good guarantee. In particular, these lower bounds are not too far off. So they're guaranteed to be at least the true count minus the, norm, the length of the stream divided by s. Okay. And this is more or less the best you could hope to do because there might actually be, um, there might actually be um, s elements that have a frequency of m over s. Okay. All right, so how can you make this expandable? Well, I think the natural idea is just to allow the number of pairs to grow. And I think the way I like to think about it is that we have phases. In the i phase, we handle two to the i elements, and we have some space budget, si. Okay. And let's say that the space budget is, is growing over time. Okay. So we want to allow uh, larger and larger sketch, um, and then, you know, the argument from Mr. Gries generalizes that you kind of make the error that you made make in the i phase is going to be number of elements divided by si, basically. So you get this, the total, the total error in your lower bounds is, is this sum 2 to the i over, over si. Um, yeah, so now we can start choosing different values of of SI, so there are, there are different kinds of trade-offs you can you can do. So one thing you could do is to choose SI such that it's um, you know basically the length of um, the phase two to the i divided by some delta. But then to to make things converge, we actually make it a little bit bigger. So we in the i phase we use a factor i squared more space. So that's that's one way. Um, this means that the space is bounded by m log squared m divided by delta. So if delta is significantly larger than, than uh, log m squared, that's uh, sublinear. Um, and the maximum error is going to be bounded in terms of, of delta. 
basically because the error that we make in each each of these phases, like like we saw before, is going to kind of decrease fast enough that we have convergence. Um, I don't know if this polylog factor is actually necessary or if there's some some lower bound. So that's that's one one question here. Maybe more interesting, we we could uh, param uh, we we could use uh, space that is the square root of the length of the phase. Okay, so two to the i over two. Okay, so this means that at any time after seeing m stream elements, we use space root m, and then actually all these bounds also uh, are dominated by the by the last last term, and we get kind of a an error that is root m. Question from July. Yeah, I'm curious on, so on the first, on the previous slide, I think, before you did the expandable version, your error, you stated it as m over s, right? For just the basic misdegrees. Yes. Um, but you know, <clears throat> it's also true that the error is like, this m is like the L1 norm, basically. And it's also true that you can replace that m with like uh, the L1 norm ex ignoring like the tail, basically. The L1 norm ah. of, of everyone except for the top s. Yes. So I'm wondering, uh, is there anything like that that you can do for this? Okay, that's that's a great question. I haven't thought about it. Um, I, I I don't know, but that would definitely be if if one could get some some kind of um, yeah residual tail bound. Yes. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, we we use space root m. We get error root m. Which is actually optimal, right? So, so here we actually get get this kind of expandability without without paying uh, kind of an, an overhead. Uh, okay. So that was expandable misregrees. So the final question, or sorry, the the final example is k minimum value or bottom k sketch, um, and I'm going to consider the distinct elements problem. So we have the stream, and we want to Maintain information about the number of distinct items that have appeared in this. And the k minimum value sketch basically maintains a sample given by a hash function. So we have some hash function h, um, and we maintain the elements that have the smallest hash, va hash values. So elements that have the hash value be below some threshold tau, where tau is chosen such that the sample is, is smaller. Um, and you can use this to estimate the number of distinct elements. So it turns out that you you basically look at the maximum hash value in your in your sample, uh, and from that you can compute a good estimate for the for the number of distinct elements. Um, expandable version. Well, I mean, kind of the obvious thing is is just to increase the number of samples, right? So the only thing is that. If you increase how big your sample can be, of course, that doesn't immediately give you more samples, right? So I can say that I, now I don't want 1,000 samples, now I want 2,000 samples. But of course, I mean, that, that doesn't bring about the samples. So, but what does happen is that if you increase the bound, then you can avoid decreasing tau. Okay. So, so basically, if you increase the, the bound on the size of the sketch, then at least after some time, if you see enough new elements, eventually it's going to fill up to, to size k. Um, yeah. So what can you do with this, this kind of thing? So, um, well, one thing you might want to do is to actually increase precision over time. So you could maybe go for additive error rather than multiplicative error. Okay. So for example, Maybe at time m, we want to be able to estimate the number of distinct elements with an additive error that is m to the two-thirds, okay. rather than um, some kind of relative error bound. Okay. And why might you want to do that? Well, one application, I think it was also mentioned in, in one of the previous talks, is that if you want to estimate set intersections, so suppose you have two such sketches and you want to uh, estimate the number of elements in the intersection between the sets, you can use this uh, this formula basically to say that uh, yeah the number of elements in the intersection is the number of the sum of the number of elements in the sets minus the size of the union. Right? So if you have the sketches, you can estimate all of these three quality uh, quantities, 
but the issue is that if you have relative error, uh, you might not get any kind of meaningful uh, guarantee if the intersection is, 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 is small, right? So the smaller the intersection, the better error you, you want. So, so in particular, if I want to be able to estimate intersection sizes that are less around m to the two thirds, I need additive error less than that. And um, yeah, so in the expandable version, um, it seems that you can simply do, do this, that you let k grow. And I'm hiding some, some, some details here, but conceptually this gives you a relative error, which is one plus minus one over root root k, which is one plus minus m to the minus one third. And this gives you this absolute error of m to the two thirds. I mean, I'm cheating a little bit here because it might actually be that all the distinct elements come early, right? And then when you want you to increase the size of the sketch, you know, you don't really, um, you never make use of it, right? Um, but in even in, in that case, you should have an absolute error of at most m to the two thirds. Okay, so I talked the title of the talk was re Resizable Sketches. I talked about expanding sketch size. What about reducing sketch size? Well, it turns out that this is usually much easier. So that's, that's why I didn't talk much about it. So for filters, if you have the hash values with range 2m, you can easily compute the hash values with range m. You so please, you can just decrease counters to reduce the number of pairs. k minimum value, you can decrease the threshold and throw away things. Uh, there are also sketches like HLL that are easy to decrease the size. You can do like pairwise max and, and so on. So I think usually the issue comes from expanding. I mean, the, the amount of information you store rather than decreasing. Okay, so I think there's a lot of open questions in this, uh, in, in this space. Um, one thing is that, I mean, even though you can do uh, space uh, size estimation with k minimum values. Maybe you want to use something better like HLL, um, but can you expand that? And uh, I simply don't know. I think that's a nice question to, to think about. Uh, this this uh, bound I gave also depended on the length of the stream. Is it possible to get something that depends on the number of distinct, distinct elements, like additive error that depends on the number of distinct elements? I assume not, but I don't have a lower bound. Um, yeah, this multiplicative space overhead for expandable misregrees with kind of a bounded error. Is it needed or not? I don't know. Um, and of course, there are lots of other sketching problems like quantiles, graphs, matrices, whatnot. Um, and I would be surprised if, if kind of adjusting sketch size wasn't you know, relevant for, for some of them, though I don't know these applications too well. And then I guess also lower bounds. So that's basically what I had. Oh, right, yeah. What about turnstile streams, deletions, and so on? So the methods that I had have presented don't don't deal with that at all. And that's all I have. Thank you. If you go back to your slide on the KMV uh, sketch uh, where you show the error. So if, if my understanding is correct, what, what you're doing for this expandable is you're uh, changing the definition of error to be an additive error. Did I read that? Um, expandable version. Yeah, I mean, if... Because KMV normally is a relative error um, exactly. Multiplicative error as opposed to an additive error. So I, I don't see that this is yes. the quite I mean, the right slide. You, you, Maybe it's the next you one. You can also think about it as getting a better and better multiplicative error. I mean, that's equivalent. Okay. So the multiplicative error is not some fixed one plus epsilon, but it's one plus something that is decreasing over time. Okay. So that, um, yeah, the bigger your, your set, the better approximation you want. Right, right. Yeah. And you're still maintaining that. I, I was a little con 
confused yeah, by I the mean, use of the word additive uh, error. I mean, so. it's it's maintained it's maintained as a price, right? It it does require more and more space over time, right? But if your application requires that you are able to um, have small error, like uh, for estimating set intersections, for example, then 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 it might be be the only way to do it. So then, again, it's not sublinear in space. Um, so it's, um, it's it's sounds like a super linear. In space. No, this this would actually be. I mean, it depends on how you set set the parameters. But uh, but but this this one you you can make sublinear if you. I mean, if you if the approximation you require is not too. Um, it's not too good, right? It, it so it, what? it depends. It depends on how 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 quickly do you want the approximation to improve, right? If you want the approximation to really quickly become very good, then it's linear space, right? But uh, but if the approximation is is kind of more kind of uh, improving more more gently, like like in this example here, then then you actually get. I mean. <coughs> This would give give additive error m to the two thirds and space m to the two thirds. Okay, so so both of which of which are sub sublinear. Yeah, I'm also confused why you use the include exclude expression for your uh, intersection uh, when you have representation of all the elements. So, in our experience, anyway, the. Uh, include exclude expression gives you much worse error to start with so this is this is the yeah this this formula is 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 on the on the on the sets not on the sketches this is on, on what this is on this on the original sets not not on the, on the samples um okay but each of those each of those terms has uh even though you show plus and minus the error statistically is additive across all those. Yeah, terms. yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you get uh, like three times the error. Yeah, or, it's huge. Or, or something like this. Yeah, uh, that's that's right. But maybe maybe let's talk offline. I'm not sure what your concern is. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you haven't looked at turnstile streams. But you could consider something like a count win sketch, just an update only model, which feels a bit similar to your blue yes. filter. Yeah. So have you considered there that is, at all? There is a student in Copenhagen who is working on exactly that. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the status is, but uh, but it's but it sounds like you know a good possibility to do something there. Yeah. All right. So for many sketches, uh, their analysis is based on the certain properties of hash functions. So do you think is there any research on resetable construction uh, construction of resetable hash functions or the or the use of certain hash functions make it impossible or difficult to make the corresponding sketches expandable? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite get the question. So, 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 so for for many sketches, like uh, count mean, so yeah, so their analysis based on certain um, properties of hash functions. So, do you think this um, there's mm -hmm. a nature connection between mm -hmm. expandable sketches and uh, construction of certain hash function make makes a certain hash function expandable? Ah yes, I mean it's it's true that kind of if you look at hash table literature, there's a lot of um, work on how you best expand your hash table in order to, you know, minimize space and, uh, and time and so on. I mean, I mean this this basic idea of uh, including one extra bit is actually, I mean that's that comes from the database literature in the 80s. I, I think that you can kind of almost yeah that you can you know get twice the number of hash values by just adding an extra bit to each um, so i think that's that that somehow comes from that area it's possible that one can transfer other ideas but i i'm not sure uh, 
Have you found that uh, having looked at this problem across a, several different types of sketches, uh, that there are patterns or like reusable tricks in either the um, algorithmic changes or the analysis mm -hmm. um, that are maybe apl applicable to different kinds of problems? Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, frank frankly, I haven't worked on this that much. I mean, a, with the exception of these uh, expandable filters. I mean, most of it is is kind of things that have been in the back of my mind for a while, and nothing has happened. So I thought, well, if I give a talk about it, maybe something will happen. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, um, but I'm sure that you know. Uh, I'm sure that there are some of these tricks that maybe have broad applicability, but uh, but I wouldn't I wouldn't know what to point to in particular. Thank you. Any questions? Now, I had a quick question. So I, I love the question about the the the, uh, the dynamic case. But I want to know how optimistic you were that things might. There might be positive results in the dynamic case when even the code with inserts and deletes. It just yeah. seems maybe hard because you want deletes to perfectly cancel off the inserts, and if you even if you right. change the sketch. But I think, what do you think? I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that 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 something is possible, at least for some of these problems in the dynamic case. But um, um, but there might there might indeed also be in lower bounds, which we haven't looked at at all. Probably need to allow some false negatives, right? Yeah, unless you have enough information to truly identify yeah. what has been removed. Right. So for the yeah, so so the question is, uh, what about false negatives? And I think it's it is true for the for this um, approximate membership problem or filter problem. Um, you do need, I mean, to be able to do de deletions, you need a promise that whatever you delete. Has actually been inserted. Otherwise, uh, otherwise you are going to have false negatives. So that's that's kind of a provable. Provable there. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Rasmus once more. Okay. So we now have a quick break.